morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So I'm going to say this first off. Happy 60th anniversary to Dolores and Norman Walter. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to all of you that are watching online because you couldn't dig your way out, especially in Shiv and Paula. We miss you. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of that going on. And I also want to say a big thank you to all the guys that came and worked so hard to shovel the sidewalks around here yesterday morning. That was great for you guys to come and do that. We really appreciate it. A couple of official announcements. Um, Men's Fellowship, 11 o'clock on the 22nd at Village Inn. So if you want to get together with the guys, that's where they're going to be meeting. They delayed it because of the snowstorm. So on the 22nd at 11 o'clock. Also on the 23rd, we're going to have nachos in the movie here at the church. Um, the nachos will be down at the fellowship hall, followed by the movie Jesus here um, on the 23rd. And that starts, what time does that start? Two o'clock? Okay, so two o'clock on the 23rd if you want to come for that. Um, also, Three by three dinners are gonna get started up for the summertime, that worked very well last year. Um, it's a good opportunity for you to just meet together in smaller groups. Basically, we're pairing up three couples at random to get together and have dinner or tea or whatever you guys decide to do, very informal. Um, just a great way to get to know some other members of the church. Uh, let's see here. Uh, helping hands. If you've been praying and haven't come up with anything that you think you can be helpful about, and this goes to everybody, think outside the box. We now have somebody volunteering. If you are in school and need a tutor to help you with something, we actually have a volunteer that can help you with whatever you're working on. We have somebody that can weld and fix almost anything. So think outside the box of if you need help, we probably can hook somebody up to help you. And if you want to help, think outside the box of where you might be able to help because there's a lot of broad spectrum here as to what we can do. You got a flat tire? Call Carolyn, she'll hook you up with somebody that can change the flat tire for you. We're probably not gonna fix the flat tire, but we'll put it on so you can get to the tire shop. So, so think about that. Um, we have a lot of great helpers lined up ready to go. If you're in need, do not hesitate to call Carolyn and say, I just need a little help with something and we're going to do our best to take care of it. Okay? But there's ways for you to help even if you think there's nothing you can do. We all know something. Okay? Um, praise God, Dennis is doing well. Where do you get to? Dennis is back there. Praise God. That's wonderful news that the surgery was successful. Um, we'll continue to lift him up. And also, don't forget to pray for Derek. Um, good reports for him, but he's still gonna need to have some heart surgery, which is not gonna be good, but let's pray for wisdom for the doctors and healing from the Lord. So, okay, any other announcements? Okay, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have to gather together to worship you, to praise you, to have fellowship with one another. And I thank you so much, dear Lord, for the moisture that you have given us. Please be with those that are working in the storm, those that are trying to get the power restored, the roads cleared. Give them protection, give them strength for the endurance ahead. And we rejoice, dear Heavenly Father, in the commitment they have to help take care of us. We ask, dear Lord, that you'll be with Pastor Mike as he prepares to bring your word that he will put himself aside and that allow you to work through him. We pray this all in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Okay, if you're able, please stand. I will read Revelations 5, um, 6 through 10, and then please remain standing as we sing in worship. And then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took a scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. 
And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the four, 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding a golden bowl full of incense, which were the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingpin, a kingdom and a priest to serve your God, and they will reign on the earth. The opening song is why we're here today. Worship our Lord and Savior. He is worthy. Yeah. 
reading from the book of Revelations, from chapter 5. Then I looked and heard a voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped.
dismissed. <clears throat> Let's read Matthew chapter 5 verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world, a town built on a hill that cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You may be seated. Well, as we come now together to the Word of God, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this morning that you've given us. I do thank you for the hard work of all of those who prepared our facilities for worship this morning. And uh, pray for those who are still snowed in and, and stuck in their homes and uh, some still without power, Lord. Uh, just that you would be with them, that you would be protecting them and, and meeting all of their needs. Uh, Lord, I also want to lift up many in our church family and do echo that praise uh, for Dennis's successful surgery and uh, that he's here with us this morning and pray for his continued healing. Uh, we praise you for Cinda's cousin Derek's uh, surgery that went well this week. Uh, we lift up our brother Gene to you uh, as he had a, a heart procedure on Friday uh, that revealed good results, um, but he is facing a surgery at the beginning of April, and so we lift him up even now, ask that you would be preparing him and the doctors and the surgeons, that you'd give them wisdom and skill in that surgery. Uh, we also pray for Gene and Patty's grandson, uh, who had a procedure this week to find out uh, or to try to figure out why he's not able to hold down much food and why his growth is, is so slow right now. Uh, we do pray that that would give answers. And uh, Lord, as we saw on the prayer chain this morning, uh, we pray for our sister Jenny, who's facing kidney stones right now. Uh, we pray for her healing and for a relief from, from that. For our church, Lord, we pray that you would help us to continue to focus on the real thing, and that is the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ, that our eyes would be fixed upon the cross, and all that we say and do would point people to you, what you have done for us and who you are. I do pray that you would help us in our search for a permanent worship leader, and that you would bring the right man to us for that position. I lift up our country and uh, its leaders and ask that you would work in the hearts, uh, work repentance in our country, that we would turn back to you. I also continue to pray for Israel in the situation there 
and uh, ask, Lord, that you would be glorified and that you would come to the aid and rescue of your people. And Lord, now as we do turn to your word, I pray that you would give us each ears to hear and hearts to obey. I surrender my tongue to you, that these words would be yours and not mine. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I would invite you to join me this morning in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. Uh, we're going to be looking at just a few verses this morning, verses 21 through 25. And uh, if last week was any indication, it took me almost an hour to get through the first 20 verses. Uh, so this should be mathematically a quarter of the time, right? Now, don't get your hopes up on that, sorry. <laughs> We, we do like to measure things, though, don't we? We, we measure things, and, and one of the things that I, I've noticed that we often measure as human beings is success. We like to have a measure of success. We try to quantify the results of an endeavor in order to determine whether or not it was successful. This is why runners time themselves. This is why companies and corporations report their quarterly earnings to know if they were successful. This is even why churches record their attendance. In fact, in pastor's conferences that I've attended in the past, the first question that somebody normally asks you is who you are and where you're from. And then the very next question is, how big is your church? We want to know that because we see that as a measure of success. And I'll confess that at those conferences, I can put a lot of unnecessary stock in that answer and, and either feel proud because uh, mine's bigger than yours or feel like, oh, mine's not quite as big as the church that you are pastoring, not recognizing that that is not a measure of success. In fact, the parable of the soils, we looked at this last week, it showed us that there was a measure of success at the end, and that was the crop that was produced. But the sower in that parable was not responsible for that. The sole thing that they were responsible for is sowing the word. And, and we often miss that point, that sharing the gospel, that, that sowing the word of God does not often have a measurable success. In fact, after I preached last week, I had several conversations throughout the course of this week about how you might be the one that sows it, or you might be the one that waters it, or you might be the one that harvests it, but seldom are you all three of those. Seldom do you get to see things through from start to finish. Oftentimes, you may not know the role that you have in planting that seed. But your responsibility, nonetheless, is to faithfully discharge the task that the Lord has given you. This is what we're going to see in this second parable that we're going to encounter today. Uh, this is the second of four parables recorded for us here in Mark chapter 4. And Jesus is going to use a different analogy, this time the analogy of a lamp and of that lamp's light, to teach us that our role and responsibility in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ is simply to put that light, to put that lamp where people can see it. And in this, followers of Jesus are encouraged to be found shining for Jesus and, and shining in effective places. That light is going to reveal what God wants it to reveal. It's not our job to make the light do something. It's just our job, and this is what the parable teaches, to be obedient in shining that light. And so here's what Jesus says in Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 21. He said to them, Do you bring in a lamp and put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on a stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have, will be taken from them. As we look at these verses this morning, we're going to see two principles from this text to show us our responsibility and how we should handle the gospel of Jesus Christ. The first of these principles is found in verses 21 through 23. And we see this parable of a lamp and its light, and it illustrates this fact that the gospel light must not be hidden. We cannot hide the gospel light. Verse 21 makes it very clear. He said to them, do you bring in a lamp? 
and put it under a bowl or a bed. Instead, don't you put it on its stand. Now, we don't quite understand this because when we walk into a room and we want light to be there, what do we do? We flip the light switch, except the past few days when many of us haven't had power, right? We might be a little more familiar with this. We, we may have had to be more strategic with where we are putting those lights that we are bringing in. Well, in Jesus' day, they brought in lamps into the rooms that they needed the light, but where they put that light was important because a lamp is placed to give light, not hide light. You don't put it under a bowl. You don't put it under a bed because light is useless if it isn't placed well. I learned this at a young age when my dad appointed me as the chief flashlight holder. Maybe you've filled that role or appointed one of your kids in that role. Many vehicle and house repairs, I know that's all I was doing, just holding the flashlight for him. And I wasn't always very good at it. He, he was always incredibly gentle with me of, hey bud, you're not shining it where I need it to be. And it wasn't until I got older that I realized that this is a really important job that I'm doing. I'm, I'm holding this light so that you can see what you need to see. Now in Jesus' day, when they would go into these rooms, they would have lamp stands or they would have shelves built into the wall and that's where the lamp would go. They had these small clay lamps. They burned oil in these lamps. And, and it wasn't a ton of light that this would put out. And so the placement of it was even more critical. And so what Jesus is saying here, the people hearing this would have probably laughed at this. Do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl? Do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bed? This was an incredibly foolish thing to say because they understood that the lamp went where it provided the greatest illumination to the room. Now, on the surface level, we get that, but we also know that parables have deeper meanings to them. And this parable is connected with the parable that we looked at last week. Mark 4, 1 through 20 was the parable of the soils. And we saw there that seed being scattered was the word of God being scattered to different types of people. Well, the light that Jesus is talking about here, this lamp that he is referring to, is also the word of God. This is referring specifically again to his teaching. And so he's saying that just like the role of the farmer was to sow that seed and just trust that God would grow it, the, 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 the job of that lamp is to provide light depending on where it has been placed. Our job then with the word of God is to put it in a place where its light is useful and, and not to hide it. This is why the song we sing with our kids on this topic, This Little Light of Mine, tells them, don't hide it under a bushel. Don't let Satan blow it out. Don't, don't let anything happen to this light, but instead, let it shine. Jesus employs this same parable in the text you heard just before the sermon, Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16. There he confirms that the light of the gospel that each of his followers has been given should be seen, should be placed in a, in a location where it can be seen by all in order to point people to God. He says there, I'll read it again, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus is very clear there saying, don't hide your light. Don't obscure it with anything. Just like a town built on a hill, you can see that from miles around. You can see the light of it. You have to understand this is what your light should be like as well. And, and when we look at this, we know that this is easier said than done. Because we live in a culture today that is demanding that we hide our light. That, that is demanding, no, you don't bring that near me. You don't talk about God around me. You don't talk about Jesus. That is what culture today is saying. And, and it, is a, it is not a popular thing to follow Jesus Christ. It, it is a dangerous thing in our world today. And so we could be tempted to hide that light. We, we could be tempted to, to hide it and, and not let on to people that we are a Christian. We could be tempted to not let on to people that we follow the word of God. 
We could be tempted even to obscure, to modify our message so that it's a little bit easier for other people to understand. We could be tempted, to use that light analogy, to dim the lights a little bit so that it's not so harsh, so, so that it doesn't expose sin so hard. That is a temptation that we have. And yet Jesus tells us very clearly that that lamp is meant to be put in a place where all can see it. He goes on to explain in verse 22 the purpose for this light. For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. Again, we get this in the picture of light. When you turn a light on, it sheds light. It lets you see everything, but on a deeper spiritual meaning. We understand that the light of the gospel, the light of the word of God, conceals and reveals things. It it will blow open for a person that which they wanted to conceal. And that's why people don't like it. That's why people don't like walking in the light. The Apostle John talks about how people prefer darkness to light. Because when they are in darkness, they can do whatever they want and they feel like nobody is really looking. But when they are in the light, then their deeds are exposed. And that's exactly what we see here. For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. It can't stay hidden forever. Whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. And this is what the Word of God does. This is, he's looking specifically ahead. I know this is a little confusing in light of last week because we looked at in, in the parable of the soils how sometimes parables, which is what he's using to teach with here, they do conceal things. People don't understand. They don't comprehend the deeper meaning of that parable. And other times it reveals things. Jesus is not talking about parables right now. He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about the cross. He's talking about the empty tomb. And how that is going to lay all things bare. It will disclose what is hidden. It will reveal what is concealed. And indeed, he's going to give his disciples this this task after his death, after his resurrection, to go out into the world and preach this message, to be that light in their culture. And so he understands that when they do that, the light is going to reveal everything that is hidden. And the people who want their deeds to stay hidden, they're not going to like this. They're not going to like the presence of the light. To be very, very clear about this, Jesus is not talking about a parable here. He's talking about the truth of the gospel and how he, the very Son of God, came to this earth to die in our place and and how he lived a perfect life before that, that we could be made righteous, how he died that death in our place that we could be declared forgiven, guiltless. But he was also raised from the dead so that we could be redeemed from the curse of sin. The gospel clearly reveals in this that all human beings are sinners deserving of death. And that right there is the part that the dark doesn't like to hear. We, no one likes to hear that they are a sinner, which is why when the light shines upon the darkness, the darkness doesn't understand it. The darkness doesn't accept it. This is why this is such an important thing, that, that it's not our job to make the light do something. It's simply our job to display that light. I say this because sometimes I think we can get too focused on trying to convict people of their sin, like somehow it's our job to make them see this, when really all that we need to do is proclaim the word of God, step aside and watch that word do its work. Because when people come face to face with the light of the word of God, with the truth of the gospel, it will get them. We don't have to do anything for that. It will shine into their life. They will see their state as a sinner deserving death before a holy God. But they will also see the fact that Jesus paid the price for that sin. That that Jesus offers them forgiveness. So this is the truth that is to shine upon all things. This is why Jesus declared himself to be the light of the world. John 8, 12, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is the truth of salvation. 
It is found in no other name than Jesus Christ. He is the light of the world. And at this time in Jesus' teaching, this was somewhat concealed. Not everybody was ready to accept this. In fact, just his followers kind of understood this, but it would not be made clear until the cross and the empty tomb. That full revelation would come. The full revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and God's miraculous plan of salvation dealing with our sin. It's not clear until the cross. It's not clear until the resurrection. And yet, even here, Jesus is saying, watch out for this. The light is going to come, and it's going to disclose things. It's going to bring things out into the open. You will someday see things clearly. In fact, this is the point of verse 23. There's a call there for people to pay attention to his words. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Mark first records Jesus used this phrase in verse 9 of chapter 4. He uses it all throughout the Gospels. And it is always a call to pay special attention to the teaching that you are about to hear. In other words, it's Jesus' way of saying, listen up, this next part is really important. If you have ears to hear, hear this. Now, does this mean that anybody can hear this? I don't think so. I know that not everybody has ears to hear. You've probably been in conversations like this before, where you're talking to somebody and you're realizing they're not listening to you. I'm really bad at this with my kids, to be very honest. They, they can come up and talk to me, and if I'm reading or I'm watching something or I'm working on something, I don't realize they're talking to me for about the first 10 seconds. And then there's that question, okay, Dad? And I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to say here. So repeat yourself to me. I, did, I wasn't listening to you. Well, Jesus is very clear here that you need to hear these words. You need to draw your attention to what he is saying here. And, and in the deeper context of this parable, he's talking about the truth of the gospel, and he's saying, you need to get this. You need to understand this. And you need to do this. Because everyone who hears the words of Jesus Christ should attend to them, should receive them should appropriate them for themselves, should apply it in their own lives in obedience. When we put his words into practice, that's the surest proof that we have truly understood them. And so when we're talking about the gospel, how do we put that into practice? Well, it's a very simple thing. It's a very simple thing. And it's to believe it. That's what the gospel tells us very clearly. The Bible teaches in Romans 10, verse 13, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so that's what we do. That's how we respond to these gospel truths. Maybe you've never heard it this way before. Maybe this call to have ears to hear is actually the one that got through to you. The gospel's been clearly presented. Do you have ears to hear it? Have you responded to the message of salvation found in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? If so, call on Jesus as your Savior and Lord and be forgiven of your sin. I know that most people in this room, you have that relationship with Jesus Christ. And so what does this mean for you? What does this analogy of that lamp and, and putting it where people can see it mean for you? Well, I'll ask part one of this question now and then the second part at the end. But if you have been saved by the work of Jesus Christ, can anyone tell? Can anyone around you tell that that is a truth for you? Is the light that you have on display or are you hiding it? Now, again, this is a hard thing in the culture that we live in today because there are so many places in our culture that has so rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ that it would just be a lot easier for us if no one there knew that we were a Christian. It, it would be a lot simpler for our lives if no one at our workplace, no one at our school, maybe no one in our family knew that we were a follower of Jesus Christ. But there's no clauses in this. Jesus doesn't say that you need to put this light where people can see it as long as it's not going to be inconvenient for you. That you put this light where you, people can see it as long as you're not going to get in any trouble for doing it. He tells us to put this light of the gospel, to not hide it, even if you face rejection, even if you face ridicule for your faith in Jesus Christ. You still need to shine it so all can see it. 
Even when you may be tempted to obscure that truth or to water it down or, or to say, well, I'll just show this much of this light in order to make yourself more acceptable or the gospel more attractive to our fickle culture, you must set the light of the gospel in a high place so that its light will shine forth. Indeed, we must have such a high view of the gospel. We must have such a high view of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we would never dare to try and obscure it, to try and put it under that bowl, to try and hide it under that bed. We must put the light of the gospel in a place that its light will shine forth in our lives. Let's move on to the second principle that we see here. Verses 24 and 25 show this second principle of the passage. And that's the fact that the gospel message must be received. The gospel message must be received. And there's, there's really two dimensions to this. There is received in acceptance. We, we accept it. We put our faith in Jesus Christ. But then there's also the aspect of, of it being received where we put it into practice in our lives. That obedience concept. This indicates to us that hearing is not enough. Hearing must bear fruit. In fact, you can go back again to the parable of the soils. All of them heard the word, all, the word that fell on the hard soil, the word that fell among the thorns, the word that fell among the rocky places. They heard the word, but not all of them put it into practice in their lives. Not all of them produced fruit. So this is why Jesus begins verse 24 with this charge to consider carefully what you hear. Again, he's highlighting his teaching. And, and I know that Mark's gospel doesn't focus on Jesus' teaching. We don't have as much record of his parables or of his teaching as we do in the other three gospels. But any time that we do see Jesus' teaching, it is in the forefront. It is primary. And what he's saying here, carefully consider what you hear. He wants his listeners to think about what they have heard. If they've heard the truth of the gospel, they should consider it with care. It's not something that they need to make a knee-jerk reaction decision to. It, it is something that they need to chew on. It is something that they need to digest. And, and the reason for this is because there's a cost involved in the gospel. The, there is a cost, and that cost, as I said already, is obedience. The cost of the gospel is our obedience. James writes of this in James 1, verses 19 to 22. He talks about the careful thought and, and its, its results. He says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. And then he says this in verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. If we are to accept the word that has been planted within us, the fruit that that will bear is our obedience. And so when we carefully consider the words of Jesus Christ, that should lead us to receive and to obey those words. In fact, this was so central to Jesus' message that when he concluded the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7, he taught on many different topics. And he gives a final illustration, the final thing he says on the Sermon of the Mount. It centers on this concept of obedience. Matthew 7, 24 through 27 records, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When he gives this teaching, it does not hinge on whether or not you heard his teaching. It hinges on whether or not you obeyed his teaching. That's the only difference here. The wording is exactly the same. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into 
practice. The fate of that house in the parable depends on whether or not the word was obeyed. And so to receive the gospel message, it must be obeyed. It it must be something that we put into practice in our lives. The teachings of Jesus must be something that we model our lives after. Verse 24 goes on to teach. Jesus says, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Now, this is a very tricky phrase. There's, there's a play on words that we don't quite understand here, but it's actually a really neat thing. When Jesus talked about that lamp and putting it under a bowl, it was a very special type of bowl that all Jewish houses would have had. It was their measuring bowl. This is what they would make their food in. Really, they, they just had the one. They had one of these bowls, and this was their measuring bowl. And so he's, he's looking back at that analogy. And and he's he's bringing that out and saying, with the measure you use, that's how it's going to be measured back to you. He's used this phrase in a couple other places. Uh, Once to encourage generosity, Luke 6, verse 38. He says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. The principle he's teaching there is that there is a reward found in your generosity, that that you will get something back when you are generous to others. That that may be a tangible or a temporal reward, something here on earth that you receive. It may be an intrinsic reward, something that your soul receives nourishment from that generosity. Or it may even be a spiritual or eternal reward. Regardless of what type that reward will take, the generosity will be rewarded. With the measure you use, how generous you are to others, that's what will be used. It will be measured to you. He also teaches this same phrase in Matthew 7 too, but this time in the context of judgment. He says, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. In other words, he's saying if you're judgmental, you'll be judged by that same standard. If if you're holding people to that high standard, if you are withholding your forgiveness, if you hold a grudge against others, that's how you will be treated in return. On the flip side, if you are forgiving because you've recognized how much God has forgiven you, that's the measure that will be used in forgiveness towards you. Again, we have rewards on many different levels for this action. Now, in our context, in Mark 4, 24, what does he mean when he says, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more? He's talking about, again, attending to his teaching. If we look at the context there of verse 24, he said, consider carefully what you hear. That's what he's speaking about. That's the measure that you need to use. What he's saying here is that the more you consider carefully what you hear, the more you dwell on, the more you meditate on, the more you study, the more you pray about what you have heard, the more you're going to get out of the teaching of Jesus. The, The more effort that is put into hearing, understanding, and especially obeying, the more you're going to get out of this. Now, there's different levels of this. Again, some may be temporal, some may be immediate. When, when you are walking with the Lord, when you are obeying the things that He has told you to do, you may have that easy path in your life. Other times you may not. I know there's plenty of people in this room that can look back at times in their life, maybe even right now, and say, I am being obedient to the Lord. Why am I dealing with this? Why, why am I facing these struggles? The greatest understanding of this is a future one. When we live our lives having received the gospel of Jesus Christ, having put it into practice in the way that we treat and tell others, we will gain an eternal reward. The theological term for this is glorification. It talks about the eternity that we will spend with God in heaven. And scripture is very clear that there will be rewards there. Now, it's always an interesting thing to me because as much as I want rewards, and I do, I I want to be rewarded. I want those crowns to be given to me. Who who doesn't want that? You know what we do with those crowns when we are in heaven? We cast them at the feet of the lamb who was slain. We, We throw them at his feet. Everything we have done can't be for our glory. 
It is to give God more glory. And so this is the reward in that glorification. Speaking of an eternity spent with God in heaven. This is the everlasting covenant that the Lord promised to His people. So we need to understand it here. That, that when we do apply ourselves to the teachings of the Word of God, when we put these things into practice in our lives obediently, faithfully, that there will be a reward to this. We, I'm quick to separate this. Ephesians 2 is quick to separate this from our salvation. We do not work ourselves into heaven. We are not justified because of any work that we have done. But good works are a crucial part of that process of sanctification, and they will be rewarded in glorification. This is what he's saying here. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. As much as you apply yourselves to hearing and doing the word of God, the reward that you receive will match up with that. It will be related to that. One final thought in this passage is found in that last verse, verse 25. And this is a hard one. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. I like that first part. You probably like that first part too. There's an encouragement there. Those who have will be given more. Those who prove faithful with what they have will be rewarded with more. If, if, if we're looking at the context of understanding Jesus' teachings and putting these things into practice, those who seek to understand and obey Jesus' parables will continually receive greater understanding, will be drawn deeper into our relationship with the Lord, will be able to be more fruitful in our lives as we live for Him. Jesus' parables teach us very clearly here that those who apply themselves will receive that greater understanding and application. And really, this goes back to what Jeremiah said, Jeremiah 29, 13. He quotes the Lord who says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So the more we put into a thing, the more we get out of a thing. The more we put into that relationship with the Lord in understanding and in obedience, whoever has will be given more. The second part of that verse we don't like as much. It's a dire warning given to those who are content with a surface level understanding of Jesus' teachings. With a surface level understanding of the gospel and the word of God. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. There's an echo here to the parable of the talents, which we see in Matthew 25. That parable records three servants. Their master is leaving, and they're each entrusted with a certain amount of money. And the first two, while the master is gone, they take what the master has given them, and they double it. And when he comes back, when the master comes back and settles up with these servants, they both receive the same commendation. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. So again, whoever has will be given more. But we know that the third servant does not fare as well. He was not faithful. He was not productive. Verses 24 to 30 of Matthew 25 say this. Then the man who received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a serious thing that Jesus is teaching here. And when we bring this into the context of the parable in Mark chapter 4, we understand that this is hinging on what somebody has done with the revealed word of God, with the gospel. 
If they have taken it and received it and applied it into their lives, they will be rewarded in the end. But if like that third servant, they have taken it and buried it and done nothing with it. Maybe they've sold themselves on the lie that, well, I'll deal with this when I'm older. I'll, or I got, I got some other things in my life that I have to get straight first. That then I'll go out and I'll invest my master's money. This third man failed to understand the seriousness of what had been given to him. He failed to comprehend. He failed to receive. He failed to accept and apply the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no comprehension in his life. There is no understanding of it. And there is no fruit. And the same is true of those Jesus speaks of in Mark 4.25. If people do not correctly respond to the good news of Jesus Christ, he says, even what they have will be taken from them. What he's talking about there are the temporal blessings of this life. In theological terms, we call that common grace. The air you breathe, the food you eat, these are good things. The, the places that you get to see, the creation that you get to observe, these are good things. And yet Jesus is saying that that's going to be taken to the, to the one that has not, to the one that does not have. Even what they have will be taken from them. I recently heard it explained this very sobering way. The pastor said, For a believer who is saved by God's grace through faith, this earth with its trials and with its temptations, with its difficulties, this is the closest that that believer will ever get to hell. And I look at that and I say, praise God for that. But then he turned it around and he said, for an unbeliever who does not receive, who does not accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, this place is the closest they will ever get to heaven. Ouch. I don't think people realize that. I don't think we realize that. Because we get so fixated on this world. We get so fixated on gathering as much as we can of experiences, of wealth, of health. We, we want these things in this world, not understanding that as believers in Jesus Christ, this is nothing compared to heaven. Man, if we were to dwell on heaven, if we were to think about that scene that we heard out of Revelation 5, that throne room where everyone is saying, worthy is the lamb because you were slain. If we were to think about heaven more often, I think that this earth would begin to taste like ash in our mouths. And, and I see this in, in the Christians who do focus more on, on what's coming next. But I also see a byproduct in their lives. Because they know that this is temporary, that this is fleeting, that this will one day pass away, they're not investing here in this world. They are making investments that last into the next world. And you know, something that's amazing in that is there's only three things that are eternal. Only three things that the Bible says are eternal. God is eternal, the Word of God is eternal, and the souls of men are eternal. And so if we are to make an investment that will last, we ought to be spending our time on one of those three things. On our relationship with, his, with our Lord. On our understanding of His Word. Or, as we see in this parable on the souls of men, and on shining our light where others can see the gospel of Jesus Christ. So where do we go in light of these short but profound verses? How should we respond to this? The answer to this question depends on where you are right now in your relationship with the Lord. But it can be summed up in this conclusion. You need to either receive or display God's light. And maybe it's both. Maybe both of these are true of your life. To receive it, maybe you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ. That's the first step of this. Maybe you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, but you haven't gone on to obey Him. Your life really doesn't ha have any change in it. That means that the light that you have been given, you're putting it under the bed. You're putting it under the bowl. And so maybe you need to display God's light. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, your response to the truth of the gospel is to receive it. If you don't know what that means, 
If, if this sounds vaguely familiar, don't leave this place before you have an answer to those questions. Ask me, ask the person that you're sitting next to, anyone in this room who's a follower of Jesus Christ, it would be our privilege to share with you what Jesus has done to save us. If you do have a relationship with Jesus Christ, what's the condition of your light? Are you displaying that light so that others can see it? It's the second part of that question I asked earlier. Can anyone tell that you are a Christian? Billy Graham said it this way. He said, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And he went on in one of his crusades to discredit a lot of the evidences that many of us may give for that. One of the primary pieces of evidence we might submit is, well, I go to church every Sunday. Sorry, that's inadmissible. That, that doesn't matter. It, does, it doesn't. It's a good thing. Please keep going to church every Sunday. But that does not make you a Christian. I don't know what comedian said it, but going to church does not make you a Christian as much as standing in your car in your garage would make you a car. That's not how this works. Just your proximity to the Word of God, that's, that's not enough. He also went and talked about all the cross jewelry that people wear. That's not admissible evidence. All the fish bumper stickers on your car, that's not admissible evidence. What is evidence? Well, what is the evidence that would convict you of being a Christian? Well, it would be based on two things. It would be based first on your testimony. Do you know, do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? That's the first piece of evidence that you could submit. That, that you believe He died for you. That you bring nothing to this equation. And that He died for the forgiveness of your sins. But the second piece of evidence, and this is the more observable one, would be found in the way that you live your life. Are you living in obedience to the Word of God? Are, are you seeing the commands of Jesus and making sure that your life matches up to that? That is the acceptable evidence. That's what would convict you of being a Christian. Jesus' words in this passage teach us that we must handle the lamp of God's word correctly. That we must shine the light that God has given us in a place where all can see it. That we must receive and display God's light. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the light that you have given us through your Son and through your word. Lord, you have called each of us to give a response to this. And I do pray, Father, that if there are any in the sound of my voice that do not know your Son as their Lord and Savior, that even now that you would be calling them to yourself, that they would surrender their life to you, knowing that there is nothing they can do to deal with their sin on their own. There is no price that they can pay, but instead, Lord, we recognize that you through Jesus, have paid it all. Lord, for others in this room, I pray that you would give us your boldness to take this light and shine it where others can see, to share the truth of the gospel in the places that you have planted us, in the workplace, in our schools. Lord, wherever it is, in our families, wherever it is that you have placed us, I pray that you would help us to take advantage of those placements to be bold, to be clear, and to shine the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me, please. Turn their hearts to the right, a story of truth. 
As we close, I'm reading from 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the light that you have given us, for the light that you indeed are. I ask that you would help us to receive this light, to walk in this light, to shine this light. And as we just sang, to tell your story to all the nations, to those near and those far, to those in our lives and those around the world, that Christ's great kingdom will come on earth, that kingdom of love and light. Father, we thank you for who you are, for what you have done for us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.